test. All right, so good afternoon, good morning, good evening, whatever you are in the world. First of all, can I have a sound check, please? Can you hear me well, loud and clear? Please let me know. All right, that'll be that'll be great. Let me just make sure that the sound is not so high and is not so low too. Uh, but I guess it's it's good for everybody now, right? Is that correct? All right, well that's actually good. All right, we'll just give it a few more seconds before we actually start. Okay, I can hear myself well, so you guys should be able to hear me well. Yeah, okay. Well, that's good to know. Okay, uh, let's just go ahead and uh, yeah. okay. well, that's good to know. give it a okay. go. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Um, all right, I guess uh, we'll just have to go ahead and switch to our main screen. Again, good afternoon, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, whatever you are in the world. And uh, today is basically the FOMC day, which is kind of a kind of an exciting, I guess. Uh, hopefully, that the Fed will give us some uh, reasons whether to uh, or clear reason whether to buy or to sell. First of all, can you guys let me know where are you uh, joining us from? I can see South Africa is watching. Welcome from South Africa. Um, one second, let me just make sure that I have everything set in here. Right, this one is good. The other one should be just in case. And yeah, so. We have from Mauritius, India, UK. Bangladesh, Nigeria, Kenya. All right, well, that's good. Malaysia, Indonesia. Well, that's actually good. Sudan, Canada. Well, that's actually good. Dominican Republic. So, yeah, we have, like, almost, like, all over the world uh, from, like, different time frames. Philippines, uh sudan yes i said that uae jawad welcome i also live in the uae so uh let's uh basically start uh today with uh just uh having a look real quick at what is actually happening in the markets oh sorry about that it should go back live yeah um so uh basically today i mean there is of course, as you know, Pakistan, Egypt, uh, Turkey. All right. Okay. That's pretty good. Um, I guess it's kind of a little bit high. All right. So um, 
basically today, uh, of course, everybody's waiting for the Federal Reserve decision, which will be announced in just a few, uh, like like almost uh, 25 minutes from now. And it is going to be, uh, it is very um, important decision today because uh, we've seen a lot of like economic data for the past few, uh, for the past few months or the past few weeks also. And um, I hope that today's, I mean, today's decision is going to be very tricky because it's not only one thing. Um, excuse me. Uh, first of all, the Federal Reserve is expected to keep the current policy unchanged. And when we say policy, this means we're talking about the um, uh, the Fed fund rate in addition to the um, the, Q, uh, the QE or the quantitative easing program. And uh, but the most important thing that uh, we will be waiting for is basically two things. The economic projections, that's number one, or the Federal Reserve will be publishing its economic projections for uh, for the next uh, uh, few quarters and uh, what we uh, call the dot plot. And I think that we can see the dot plot on Bloomberg. Yeah, if I see dot plot, we can actually see it here. Uh, yeah, and that's uh, the uh, the dot plot. Let's just go ahead and have a look at it real quick. That's the uh, Federal Reserve dot plot, which basically uh, we will be looking at. And what does this chart list actually means is like what the members of the uh, Federal Reserve are actually expecting for rates over uh, over medium term, short term, and or medium term and long term. Long term, of course, everybody is talking about two and a half percent, but for the time being. Uh, they are talking about in 2022. Uh, there is some sort of like a uh, few members. You can see my yeah. Few members are actually uh, calling for like kind of some like with three members calling for a slight rate hike, and um, uh, only one member is calling for a rate hike of like almost 0.5%. Uh, However, this doesn't mean that is going to be right. We actually don't know, but in general. Uh, we have uh, the most important thing will be, uh, of course, uh, if we're going to talk about the FOMC is going to be the press conference or which is the most important thing. Everybody is waiting uh, for the Fed to talk about tapering. And if you are not aware of tapering, I encourage you to read about it. But at the same time, let me just um, real quick uh, talk about tapering um, or just explain it in a little bit. So. Uh, the Federal Reserve, after you know Corona hit the world, they had to do what is it called the QE program. And uh, the QE program is basically when they uh, bought a lot of bonds. Let's just go ahead and make it just shorter. Sorry, uh, it's going to take so much time. Um, there we go. Weekly, monthly, whatever. And let's take it actually monthly because we're going to talk about what happened back in 2007, 2008. So the Federal Reserve was forced kind of like to launch a quantitative easing in order like just to stop the economy from crashing and just to stop the economy or like to reignite the economy uh, because of what happened, the effect of, uh, of Corona. And um, back and that's one of the things that we uh, saw back in 2008 when the Federal Reserve actually added a lot of QE. And then they started kind of like tapering or like uh, tapering, just stopping the QE and then uh, start unwinding their balance sheet. But this is actually didn't happen too much. And then uh, we saw what happened uh, because of uh, because of COVID. So the Federal Reserve had to increase its bond uh, assets or bond buying program. So now everybody is waiting for the Federal Reserve to tell us when they are expecting to stop to stop or at least to start trimming down uh, what we call is the uh, the quantitative program or the quantitative easing program. And this will have like a substantial um, a substantial uh, effect on uh, the US dollar because that's what actually happened over uh, the past few years. I mean, if you, we have a look right now and let me just add one, uh, uh, let's add the dollar index, which is very important. And I want all of you like from now, I mean, in the next a few, in the next few days, in the next few weeks, I want you to read about what happened to the dollar right when the Federal Reserve started to uh, talk about 
Well, let's just move this on the side. Yeah, that will be easy, even better. Oh, yeah. And this one on this side. That will be easier, I guess. Uh, but anyway. Yeah. So whenever the Federal Reserve actually talked about tapering back in 2018 or 2008 or 2009, it was actually 2000. And 14 this is when the dollar started like to go up and the market actually um, priced in such move in advance and this is because that's the uh, uh, the nature of the market we always uh, price in expectations but in advance and this is might actually what might uh, might happen next and that's what I'm actually looking for because if the Federal Reserve hinted about like a time when they will actually start tapering the QE I'll basically just say that the dollar downside trend is over and we have to uh, look for uh, higher uh, higher US dollars. So from now until then, we'll talk about it uh, just later. But let's go ahead and just uh, have a look at the US dollar index, which is basically what we will be focusing on today. Um, and one thing that we just need to make some kind of kind of rules um uh today for today's stream um i don't need any one of you to react to the market uh or to the re right i mean do not just react to once the numbers or once the uh once the decision comes out as always i don't know if you've seen any of these streams before but um uh whenever there is a decision like that we will have to read the statement and then uh, we will just at least wait for pullbacks or retracement or whatever before we actually enter any kind of trades. We've seen this um, in non-farm perils. We've seen this in the ECB last week that we had actually a very good trade on it. The same thing goes to the US dollar index or uh, what's going to happen today in FOMC. So there is no need uh, by any chance to um, uh, react to the market or react uh, To react to the data once they are out take a breath read the statement and then we will see what we will do if by any chance the market doesn't actually move at all which is unlikely but let's say by any mean if the market did not actually move at all uh there's no problem with that we can still uh um a trade but not today there's always tomorrow we will always have the market here to trade in the next few days, in the next few weeks, there's always tomorrow. You don't need to um, just to react to the market just because you do. You just want to trade, okay? Because everybody wants to trade. We already know that, but at the same time, um, there is no need to uh, to do that because uh, if you're just gonna uh, go ahead and uh, react to the market, this is what is called chasing. Um, and this is basically what usually happened to 90 percent maybe i would say uh to traders who actually chase the market and whenever you chase the market you will end up losing and you will not end up um uh, making money so uh today also um uh, let me show you the i will be showing the uh also the press conference that we will be actually listening to it um that we will listen to uh during the uh the stream today let's do the slide uh it's going to be on the screen right here and it is still actually well i'm just going to keep this screen for the time being and we can just wait for it because the moment it actually starts that would be very good to keep an eye on uh so the press conference we'll just wait for the press conference and again uh once there is any kind of trade i will say it in uh like by voice i'll post it on the screen and uh, you will be the first to know if I'm taking any kind of positions, whether long, short, whatever. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be uh, on the screen. Let's go ahead and just uh, uh, read some of the uh, comments here. Here, it is so tricky because inflation is so high, and the Fed cannot raise rates, and they will print more money due to Biden plans. So it is so hard. Okay, well, let's start with this one: printing more money. I don't think so. They all do that. Uh, more likely the Federal Reserve is going to keep uh, the current policy without changing anything, I believe. There is not going to be any kind of uh, 
uh, changing in policies. And uh, what I say by like changing policies, I don't think so that the Federal Reserve will raise QE anytime soon, unless if we see like any kind of like another recession, maybe, which is I don't think so. It's going to happen, uh, or at least it's not on the radar that we will see any kind of another uh, another recession uh, very soon. So that's uh, that's a one thing. So uh, at the same time, um, uh, about increasing rates, they can still increase it, but they don't want to just rush into it. But what we need to know from the Federal Reserve today is one thing. What are they going to do in the next few months? Is it going to be, um, will the Fed actually start tapering this year or next year? That's the most important thing that we will be waiting from the Fed today. Um, if they actually, you know, give us uh, some info about that, that would be good. If they decided not to give us any kind of new info, which is, I doubt it, the Federal Reserve has to kind of uh, move and tell us a few more info at least because uh, for the past few weeks we saw um, uh, multiple um, central banks already intervened. You had like tapering in Canada, we saw uh, Brazil uh, multiple times rate hikes, uh, Russia also third uh, rate hike or third straight rate hike. Um, also Czech Republic I guess next week they will actually uh, raise rates. So there's a lot of um, uh, central banks around the world are actually starting tapering and some of them actually starting tightening. So that's going to be uh, the most important thing that we'll be looking for. If the Federal Reserve actually tell us today, oh, we're going to, uh, that's going to be kind of like black and white today, I think. Um, if the Federal Reserve decided to um, uh, One second. If the Federal Reserve decided just to tell us like a date, that would be very, very good. And if that's the case, and if the Federal Reserve said, oh, uh, we will actually start uh, tapering this year, you have to know one thing. The dollar downside trend will be over. And what I'm saying over is means like whenever you see the dollar going down, you'll have to buy it back up again. And this is exactly what happened back in, I mean, let's go, I don't know, uh, let's go monthly. Uh, let's go ahead with monthly. And that's because, uh, again, that's, that's one of the most important things that you need to understand the, uh, the policies of the Federal Reserve and how it actually, um, uh, how it actually affect the market. So that's during the financial crisis when they announced, you know, uh, QE and everybody was just, uh, kind of uh, worried about uh, what's going to happen uh, because of the financial crisis and so so the dollar was still down at almost 75 but once the federal reserve started talking about tapering look what happened to the dollar here it went all the way from 78 all the way to 105 and that's what i'm actually aiming for in the next a few months because if the federal reserve by any chance just come up and say hey uh we will actually start tapering this year or next year but the, we need a timeline that would be i think that might be actually the the end of the uh dollar index downtrend that we saw uh since the beginning of of corona all right so i hope this is actually clear what we will be waiting so again let's just set up again one more time some rules about the about the fed decision I will be giving, maybe, it depends, but I'll be giving signals if I actually enter any kind of, uh, uh, any, uh, any trades today, I will tell you before I even execute it, okay? There's not going to be any kind of pending orders or there's not going to be any kind of like uh, uh, just reacting. No, we will read the news. We will post the news also on the screen down. And whenever there is any kind of changes, I will let you know by voice and it's going to be on the uh, on the screen you can all see it okay we have like almost like 10 minutes i'll leave it to you guys for your questions and i'll be right back in one second and i'm right back here okay well uh unfortunately today's uh stream is in arabic uh Today's stream is in English. اليوم الستريم باللغة الإنجليزية للأسف. لكن حيكون في شوي بالعربي إذا أخذنا 
إذا أخذنا أي تداولات. I was just saying that today's stream is in English and we have a lot from you know different part of the world who speaks Arabic. Uh, so t- today's stream is in English, but if I take any kind of um, uh, any kind of trades, I will announce it in English and then in Arabic. So let's see. But currently, I mean, the market is kind of, I mean, if you look at what's happening in the States today, U.S. equities rights. Today, so far, Dow Jones is down by 168 points. And S&P is just like 10 points, like quarter of a percent. It's not that bad. It's not that big deal like that we're, we're down that much so far, or at least for the time, <laughs> for the time being. Um, oh, why am I shady? Oh, um, so that's, uh, that's, that's one thing. Um, but I don't think so. The market will actually, I would love to see. The market actually just rebounding from here, which is, I think, at some point it will. Let's go have a look at Dow Jones, and then I'll answer the rest of your questions. Yeah, Dow Jones down like monthly. We're already up by four months in a row. Let's go daily. That we are kind of oh, day. Look at that. Yeah, I don't. I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight days in a row. We haven't seen since when? One second. We have to look at this one because it's very actually kind of very important. Um, let's go ahead and see rate of change daily. That's going to be interesting to see. Third day, three days in a row. And when was the last time we saw that? It was back in May. But the next one was like three. Okay, I'll be right back just in a few All right, sorry about that. So, um, Dow Jones has been going down for a few days. I don't think so. This is going to continue for a long time. I guess it's even like kind of like a. I feel like we should, we might actually need to. Mm, we're at the 50 from the last side. So, we'll see. But I'm kind of optimistic about this downside. Uh, what markets you would like to look to trade the most? I mean, I just trade everything, almost like currencies, uh, commodities, indices, stocks too. So we will look at everything. Uh, it had a nice daily correction. It might be some time to back up. If the Federal Reserve does nothing, yes, I would agree with that. Um, can we see gold? Yes, gold. I'm still uh, also just uh, XAU USD. Uh, gold, we are just waiting for the correction to finish because wait hold on because the correction i don't think so the correction is over yet because there you go i mean technical indicators are negative we broke the channel to the upside i still see we might see actually 1839 1840 this is when i would maybe think about gold at some point where can i get your signal services it's going to be it's it's with fbs we have the the uh telegram i guess and uh, the written reports every day goes out so what about PLTR? I'm still, uh, I actually went long Palantir today. Uh, my entry is at 24.69 and I'm hoping for uh, a very good PLTR US equity. Uh, yeah, I'm actually looking for a kind of very good, uh, yeah.
yeah, I basically entered almost here, so like totally fine. Uh, I like the stabilization that we saw over the past few days, especially over um, oh the trend, whether you're going to take it this or up there. But I'm actually, I already entered uh, Palantir. So we have five minutes. Let's just finish. Uh, uh, da -da 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 -da. Okay. Uh, Non-related question. Is this a standing desk? Yes, it is. It is high and low at the same time. Yeah, I can go up, you can do it down, but I like uh, whatever I trade or like um, streaming, I like to be uh, standing and I can still do also sitting on my gaming chair, but I don't do gaming, but I have a gaming chair. <laughs> anyway, what is the strategy? The strategy is we will wait for the news to come out. We will read the statement and then we will decide if there is something significant in the statement. Yes, we will do. Uh, we will do trade depending on what the Federal Reserve is going to say. All right. If there is nothing significant, I would rather just wait until the press conference. Uh, if there will be something, uh, then we will see. Okay. USD GBP is sitting on 50 EMA on the one hour chart, followed by the bounce from the trend line support. Okay. Well, here's the British pound. Guys, we don't need to spam the chat, please. Okay. I got, I got your your um uh your note bitcoin 34,000 usd yes okay but we don't need to spam it thank you so much we got it i i read it already all right well i, I mean i'm sorry but you have to stop spamming it <laughs> another one and i'm sorry i'll have to let you go All right. Uh, so for the British pound, it's actually like sitting not only on that, it's also sitting on a trend line on the daily chart. So that's why yesterday we did not actually see any kind of like we saw it a good reaction. So we'll have to see how it is going to be here. Um, uh, before going further, because we have just only two minutes left, any specific sector you are looking to add to perform well this year? I mean, I don't really. Um, I think uh, retail, that's number one. Number two, I'm looking at REITs, like a lot of REITs, especially with, uh, you know, um, everything is going back to normal gradually. So I think travel, like tourism and REITs is actually doing, uh, doing. Well, hope, I mean, I think it's going to do uh, uh, very well. Uh, gold can change direction in this week downside. Uh, everything's possible. It all depends on what the Fed's going to say. Uh, okay, two minutes. Uh, اهلا استاذ نضال نعم بالانجلش اليوم uh, بس راح يكون في عربي اذا اخذنا اي uh, اذا اخذنا اي uh, اي تريد اوكي ليتس هيد جست تو ذا ايكونومي كالندر ريل كويك اند ويت فور ذا نيوز واتس غون تو بي اوت ان 1 مينيت سو ات ستارتس ان 2 مينيتس اور نو 2 مينيتس از ذا ذا داي اور ذا 2 مينيتس از ذا ديسيجن اند ذن افتر 30 مينيتس از ذا بريس كونفرنس اوكي Bitcoin will go up in one hour. Chart, get ready. Okay, we'll see that. And uh, what else? Uh, AUDJPY. Okay, Telegram. I'll I'll just uh, send it. I guess it's gonna be. Uh, it's it's one of, on one of our websites, but I'll I'll send you the link soon. Um, What are you saying? 4K? I didn't meet any kind of Kevin or repeating whatever. Uh, what app do you use for the economy account? That's uh, the Bloomberg terminal. All right, here we go. So the first initial reaction, uh, medium benchmark on hold maintains 120 bond buying. Fed uh, medium projection shows rate increase by end of 2023. Well, that's actually kind of already. Uh, I are rate to changes. Oh, whoa. Well, here is some sort of a surprise. One second. Yeah, that is basically one second. 
So the Federal Reserve increased the interest rate on reserve balances. That is kind of like an interest rate in a different way, which is a huge, huge, huge uh, surprise. And uh, let me just uh, take down the sound for you. You don't need to listen to it. Okay. But the Federal Reserve, it again, like you keep maintaining uh, projection, median economic projection, we're talking about rate increase by 2023, which is another thing to keep an eye on. Okay. Uh, do not react to the numbers again yet. You don't need to react to the numbers until we just read the rest of. Okay, let's do news headline and have a look of what we're going to do. Uh, or we can do Fed, sorry. Here's a go. Benchmark on hold maintains 120 bond buying. That's not something new. You have 13 official seas hike by 2023 versus seven in March. So here we have like huge uh, difference or huge change about the officials who used to project seven only last uh, um, last uh, meeting. And now it's 13. So dot plots, let's see. So we have kind of a change in tone. There you go. There's a lot of, that's the new one now. We have a lot of, or multiple, at least one, two, three, four, five, over five, uh, over five members expecting a rate hike in 2022 and only two, while the rest is looking for a hike in 2023. So to start with, that's why the market is actually uh crashing kind of uh because this is actually total positive so dxy let's go g2 one second you don't need to react again we still well i mean again you don't need to react just hold on until we all right what are we doing? Here you go. Let's go Euro first. Down all the way to 2060. Yeah, they're basically kind of raised. Ah, but again, two rate hikes by the end of 23 here where we know that USD is actually or might be actually ending the um, yeah I have a look at even gold so the euro is still all the way down here let's go it's XAU equities is not bad I mean S I mean S&P is just down um, I mean not S&P Dow Jones is only like 260 points so That's what the market actually wanted to hear from the Fed. When are we actually doing that? But still, they haven't said anything about tapering still. They still haven't said anything about tapering. But yet, I mean, again... Um, I'm not reacting to this kind of move. I'm not going to chase. So even if we didn't even I need trade anything here, I'll be fine. Uh, FOMC, can I have the data for dollar, dollar yen? What data? Uh, can I have the data for Japanese? Okay. I couldn't believe I would say that, but USD to the moon. Yeah. I mean, with the Fed uh, doing so, we still, I mean, it's kind of like 50 52. I mean, I almost blow up your my account. Why? Why have it to do that?
that is kind of like excessive move. It is an excessive move. And I'm not going to chase, trust me. I'm just going to keep watching for now. Why did you trade before the news? Oh. Uh, yeah, I am definitely not going to trade this move. Do not react to the numbers again. The Fed will not inflate. The Fed needs to deflate. Um, is there a delay on the stream? It shouldn't be. Uh, there's just like a few seconds only few seconds only okay let's just explain what happened here okay just uh, for everybody to understand so the federal reserve um, the interest rate is unchanged only one thing that is actually interest rate on excessive reserves that's not a big deal but it's still something to uh, to keep it in mind at the same time the dot plot let's uh, or let's just read again a news headline and do there you go fed and let's just read what they actually said all right one by one let's do that on the side because you guys need to understand like what actually happened here so the Fed keeps the benchmark rate on hold as widely expected maintaining the 120 billion bond buying Medium projection shows two rate hike increase next or not next year, the year after 2023. All right. So we'll see like some sort of like a pullback right now on the market, but it's still fine. Um, the Fed projections now 13 officials sees hike by end of 23. But back in March, there was only seven. There were only seven members that thought we will that they will have. Uh, uh, rate increase by 2023. Now we have 13. So basically the numbers are doubled. Uh, seven official sees hike by end of 2022. So even next year, by the end of 22, we have now seven officials thinking that, oh, we might actually uh, increase interest rates in March, but uh, not in March, sorry, in 2022. And uh, also at the same time, uh, inflation expectations at 2.1 versus 2%. So they mean they increased uh, the um, inflation forecast too, unemployment 4.5. So it's kind of like discount rate unchanged. Uh, voted 11 uh, of the members like voted to keep everything unchanged today. So here, when we look at the dot plots, so let's do dot plots, uh, FOMC dots. And if we compare it, let's just have a look and compare it with the previous one. So this is the, that's the latest one. And here, let's do, I mean, now uh, we can go projections and let's do the previous one. The previous one, I mean, have a look. This is the March meeting where we had only one, two, three, and then four. They're thinking this year. And now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven that are actually thinking we might actually raise rates in 2022. 23, that's the latest. And let's go back first. 23. We had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven members only thought we will actually increase rates in 20, um, in 20, uh, 2023. Today, and have a look at today, the latest data, we have what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 members thinking that 2023 will hold 
uh, uh, will hold basically a, a rate increase. That's kind of a huge shift because on the longer term, now they're looking at 3% interest rate for the longer term. On the shorter term, 1.5 1, 1 because again, of uh, what we saw uh, in inflation data. So the reaction of the market so far, of course, is gonna be a stronger dollar, DXY currency. And I will be basically, oh, sorry, G2. What is it now? Okay, G2. G2, not GG2. That's what it is. So probably we'll see the 91 at least. And now let's just go ahead and head to the euro. It's kind of like a one-way trade kind of. And that's why I, I'm still not interested in any kind of um i'm not gonna just jump in on this trade okay that is a buying opportunity fed will play let's go why uh they are not tapering but i mean it's still tricky for tapering so right now we should be looking at buying the 10-year futures uh yeah because again like it's already 159 uh buy gold hope no no nah, i wouldn't buy gold here yet uh, so we are bullish or bearish according to you. Any trades so far? I'm not. No, my network tripped. Uh, I'm late. What we're buying? We're not buying or selling anything yet. All right. I'm not going to react to this kind of move because it is excessive. And if you're going to short here, let's say, if you're going to buy the dollar now, you'll have to wait for a few days, not for just for today. Dow Jones. Yeah, that's kind of an excessive move. Have a look at the euro. So I would definitely not be selling here because everything can actually change during uh, during the press conference if uh, Jay Powell decided to change kind of the tone. But here's the sterling also. Uh, let's go ahead and look for what? Um, gold. Bitcoined up with the Fed announcement. Mm. I mean, I think so like they have a huge... Uh, uh, confluence because oh, 38,000 now, but yeah, yeah. I I mean, for me, I am not, not gonna take anything right now because again, this is an excessive move. The euro is already down by what 100 points already, sterling is 50, uh, gold is down like almost 20. dollars I would not be touching anything. Uh, uh, shorting the treasuries, yes, it might be actually good, but still, I mean, have a look right now here, uh, USGG10. If you want to take a longer term, yes, maybe, but not, not right here. But not right here. I would never buy or sell something at the highest level of the session or at the lowest level of the session. I would like to wait for some sort of retracement. So we might actually not take anything because, again, today is kind of very tricky. Uh, let's go see what else happened in here. Yeah, I mean, look, treasuries, the two years is up by what? 13% uh, today. Whoa. Uh, 10 year yield is also 3%. The 30 years now is at 2.2%. So, uh, Yeah, I'm still watching. I'm not going to trade anything. I'm still watching. I'm not going to trade anything yet because this is an excessive move. And I would like to see um, a little bit of retracement. And I can't just take that here. No trades yet. As for, I mean, um, yeah, definitely financials is getting crushed. BTX already packed. Yeah. Yeah, gold is already 38, and we are getting out of that. NASDAQ, yeah, we can look at NASDAQ. That's kind of an excessive, again, that's kind of an excessive move, and I would not be trading anything right now. No. Yeah, 
Uh, it's kind of a also so I'm not thinking right if I'm aiming for a long trade in your sort of note T note futures. It depends on how long you're going to take it for. NASDAQ is also kind of like negative here. Uh, Dow Jones. Dow Jones is at the 60 here. Dow Jones is at this 60. Yeah, you should be you should be fine. Yeah, you should be fine. But it, again, if I were you, I wouldn't be buying or selling at these levels right now. Nothing yet. No trades. Can you tell us in Arabic what's the surprise? Okay, guys, I have to just explain something in Arabic and then I'll go back. الذي حصل خلال الاجتماع الحالي الجميع لا يوجد توقعات بموضوع رفع الموضوع بتغيير السياسة الحالية. نعم. المفاجأة اليوم أتت من هذا الجدول الذي سنتحدث عنه بعد لحظات. ثواني. I will be back with uh, with English just in a few minutes. I need to I need just to um, say a few things in in Arabic. الجدول التالي هو الجدول الذي يظهر على توقعات الأعضاء لمعادلات الفوائد المستقبلية. كان في اجتماع شهر مارس الماضي ثلاث سبع أعضاء فقط. كانوا يعتقدون بأنه سيكون لدينا رفع أسعار الفوائد في عام 2023 في هذا الاجتماع أصبحوا 13 يعني كلهم بنفس الوقت في في توقعات نهاية عام 2020 بأن يكون لدينا على الأقل رفع واحد لأسعار الفوائد أصبحوا سبعة من أصل أربعة الفدرالي رفع أسعار الفوائد ليس أسعار الفوائد العامة بينما على ما يعرف بالإكسسيف إكسسيف ريزيرف أو اللي هي نسبة الفوائد على الاحتياطات العالية وهذا الشيء اللي نوعا ما ادى الى الارتفاع الذي شاهدناه بالدولار، هل يعني ذلك ان الاتجاه العام للدولار قد اختلف؟ وارد جدا حاليا في ظل في ظل الحديث عن انه بدانا في موضوع احتماليه رفع اسعار الفوائد ابكر من السابق. اوكي، okay. that was just in Arabic just for quick for the guys in Arabic in the chat because they were asking what exactly happened. Maybe some of them doesn't get the English. It's totally fine. So we're back in uh, we're back in English again. Uh, if you have any if you have any questions, again, so far I'm not taking any trade. I'm just gonna wait for the press conference, and most probably I will not even trade anything today. After this excessive move, I would love to see some sort of retracement before taking any kind of decision. I know a lot of people would uh, would say. Uh, being reluctant, or I would like to be reluctant, better than just to get stuck in a trade that will take me for ages. Okay, markets is going down because again the Federal Reserve is telling us at some point that uh, one second. Um. And the market is is going down because the Federal Reserve again, like announced, um, or that rate hike might actually come in sooner than later, and that's what basically happened. And that's why I am not thinking about um, trading today, actually, for the time being. But again, like we will just uh, follow the market and wait of what we can do. All right, because again, that's an excessive move. You don't need to get stuck because let me tell you something. If, I mean, we read the statement, it was kind of clear, but at the same time, if you get stuck now today, if you just take any kind of trades now, you might actually get stuck with it. And you, if the, uh, if Jerome Powell started like to give us any kind of uh, um, different remarks, that might be actually the opposite way. 
or that's why I would like just to see some sort of uh, a retracement before even thinking about buying or selling anything. So that is an advice. I don't know. It's all up to you guys if you wanna uh, if you wanna buy or sell. But I would I would definitely not gonna be uh, going short on the euro or the British pound or 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 not at these levels. All right, for everyone that came late, I'm just going to put the CGs on the uh, on the bottom chart so you can actually see it if you would like to read. Um, uh, yeah, let me just write that real quick. And let's do that. Yep, that was completely hawkish Fed statement. All right, well, the press conference will start within just a few more minutes, and uh, I'm just going to um, leave the uh, press conference playing, and we will just be listening to it. And if there's going to be any kind of changes, yes, we will do. Otherwise, sorry to tell you guys that it might not be the right day to um, uh, to trade because of the excessive move that we already saw in today's. Um, sorry, I got that. And I'm sorry if it was disappointing for you today, but either we get it right or not getting anything at all. Medium projection. Here's the unemployment. And I am just going to put this up wait why Oh, sorry about that. Now we're tough. There we go. Dow is back at the lows almost. Let's have a look just really quick at uh, U.S. equities, what we are doing right now. Um, where is it? Dow is down by 300 already. S&P 4,200. Yeah, so it's kind of... Uh... All right, so now we are actually testing the 200-day moving average on the daily chart. Let's go back and see the euro. Nope, not this one. Yeah. Okay, let's take that off. 
Uh, Euro is also at the 200 day moving average. Let's do, okay, let's, uh, we'll have to have a look at the 15. So here's the thing. Since this is, again, like a huge, huge um, Fed thing, that's what I'm going to do. All right. And whether you take it or you leave it, but I will be just looking. Okay. Since today, that's how it is. These are the levels that I'll be looking to short the euro again. Nothing before that, nothing after. Either we go 2080 or 2090. That's for the euro. And I'm going to post it on the screen. AMC is just 53, nothing today, no? Those are the levels I'm looking for. Okay, the, oh, wait a second. Let me just, uh, and I'm going to post it on the screen if you guys would like to think about it. But if I'm going to short the euro, it's not going to be before 120.84. But I'm going to post it also on the screen. And you're, I'll be happy to, okay. Pending, there you go. Twenty eighty four and one point twenty ninety six. But stop loss at one twenty one fifteen. That would be the first trade, but that's pending orders. That is not real time orders. Okay. I would not be buying or selling anything unless if it goes to the levels or to the areas that I would like to see. So that's the British pound first. Uh, sorry, that's the euro first. And I'm, I just posted on the screen. Okay, you can see it down. And same thing goes to the British pound. If we see some sort of a pullback, that might be the levels that we will be looking for. Not before, not after. If it goes there, sorry. Otherwise, I am not interested in any kind of trades. Uh, the first one or the first risk would be, same thing goes for the British pound. Somewhere between 40, 75, 40, 88, not before that. Forty sixty and we do not forty sixty, forty seventy, sorry, forty seventy five and one point forty eighty eight with there you go. At, I'll just put it where, 1.41. Oh, 10. I'll do with gold. Hold on. Just give me a minute. I will go with gold too. But those are the only XAU. No, go back. Sorry, not this one. Not before. Otherwise, I don't want to be stuck in any kind of a trade for the rest of the press conference, at least. Same thing goes to gold. If we're thinking about shorting gold, which is I'm not with it too much, but we can just do it as a quick. Nothing before. 1852, 1848. Those are the levels for... There you go. Pending. Oh, 
वन सेकंड Hey guys, the uh, press conference is about to start and we will have to just listen to him. Um, uh, gold between what? 1848. It's 1848 and 1852 with stop loss at I'll have to listen to, uh, sorry, 1863, uh, no, 1857. Okay, here are your orders already, like, you'll see them, like, uh, scrolling uh, at the bottom of the page, uh, the CGs, and now we will have to listen to the press conference, so I will be off mic. I'll be off the mic, and uh, just... We'll be listening to the press conference all right and if you have any questions you can leave them in the comments but again i would not be interested in buying or selling anything right now i'm just going to put my pending orders and wait for them to deliver all right remains well below pre-pandemic levels. The unemployment rate remained elevated in May at 5.8%, and this figure understates the One second, the audio is coming.
Sorry about the audio. One second. Continuing to increase our holdings of Treasury securities by at least $80 billion per month and of agency mortgage-backed securities by at least $40 billion per month until substantial further progress has been made toward our maximum employment and price stability goals. The increase in our balance sheet since March 2020 has materially eased financial conditions and is providing substantial support to the economy. At our meeting that concluded earlier today, the committee had a discussion on pro the progress made toward our goals since the committee adopted its asset purchase guidance last December. While reaching the standard of substantial further progress is still a ways off, participants expect that progress will continue. In coming meetings, the committee will continue to assess the economy's progress toward our goals. As we have said, we will provide advance notice before announcing any decision to make changes to our purchases. And finally, we made a technical adjustment today to the Federal Reserve's administered rates. The IOER and overnight RRP rates were adjusted upward by five basis points in order to keep the federal funds rate well within the target range and to support smooth functioning in money markets. This technical adjustment has no bearing on the appropriate path for the federal funds rate or stance of monetary policy. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to support the economy for as long as it takes to complete the recovery. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Rachel Siegel, The Washington Post. Thank you, Michelle and Cal, and thank you, Chair Powell, for taking our questions. I'm wondering if you can walk us through expectations you have, specifically when it comes to the labor market going into 2023. And I'm curious about people who may have left the labor market, who have yet to come back, or who may face uh, issues with childcare, perhaps they've retired early, any barriers that you've seen keeping people from the labor market as you consider full employment going into 2023. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so. I would say uh, if you look at the labor market and you look at the, the demand for workers uh, and the level of job creation and think ahead, I think it's clear and I am confident that we are on a path to a very strong labor market, a labor market that, that shows low unemployment, high participation, rising wages for people across the spectrum. I mean, I, I think that's, that's shown in our projections. It's shown in outside projections. And if you look through the current time frame, I think one and two years out, we're going to be looking at a very, very strong labor market. Um, in terms of exactly what that means, we'll, we'll have to see how things evolve. Uh, I think we learned during the course of the last very long expansion, the longest in our history, that labor supply uh, during a long expansion can exceed expectations, can move above its estimated trend. And, and I have no reason to think that that won't happen again. Uh, at the same time, we have seen in terms of participation, we've seen a significant number of, of people retire. 
And uh, it, it, so we, we don't actually know exactly what labor force participation will be uh, as we go forward, but I, I would tend to, to look at it and think that it, that it can return to high levels, it, although it may take some time to do that. But overall, this is, a, this is going to be a, you know, a very strong labor market. In terms of the near term, you ask as well, so we see a couple of things, a few things that seem likely to be holding back labor supply. There are very large amounts of job openings and there are uh, a very large number of people who, who are unemployed. And the pace of, of uh, filling those jobs is somehow feels slower than it might be. So I point to a number of things. The first of which is just that most of the, the act of sort of going back to one's old job, that's kind of already happened. So this is a question of people finding a new job. And that's just a process that takes longer. There may be something of a speed limit on it. Um, you've got to find a job where, where your skills match what, uh, you know, what, what the employer wants. It's got to be in the right area. Um, there's just a lot that goes into, into the function of finding a job. So that's, that's sort of a natural thing. In addition, um, I would say that we, we look at, for example, uh, a significant number of people still say that they're uh, concerned about going back to work in jobs where there's a lot of public face be facing because of, because of COVID. So that's clearly holding back some people and that should diminish as vaccinations go ahead. Um, there's also uh, the, the question of childcare. M many are engaged in, in caretaking and uh, as schools reopen and, and, and uh, childcare uh, daycare centers open in the fall, or not yeah, in the fall, then we should see uh, we should see that supporting labor force participation by caretakers. Finally, unemployment insurance for um, something like 15 million people will either end or be diminished as we move through the summer and into 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 the fall by the end of September. And I'd like some of some that may also encourage some to go back in and take jobs. So. You would think that that would add to an increase in job creation as well. So you put all those together, I would expect that we would see strong job creation building up over the summer and going into uh, going into the fall. I would also say though, the last thing I would say is um, this is uh, an extraordinarily unusual time, and we, we really don't have a template or or uh, a, a, you know a, an experience of, of a situation like this. And so I think we have to be humble about our ability to understand the data. It's not a time to try to reach hard conclusions about the labor market, about inflation, about the path of policy. We need to see more data. We need to be a little bit patient. And I do think, though, that we'll, we'll, we'll be seeing uh, some things coming up in coming months that will, that will inform our, our thinking. Thank you. Paul Kiernan. Thank you, Rafael. Thanks for the question. Um, your the, the committee's meeting forecast on uh, inflation seems to assume a pretty pretty tame outlook for the rest of the year. Um, as you know, uh, the three month annualized rate for the past three months was um, I think eight point four percent in the CPI, and I'm just wondering sort of how much longer we can sustain uh, those those kinds of rates before you get nervous. Thanks. So. Um Inflation has come in above expectations over the last few months, but if you look behind the headline numbers, you'll see that the incoming data are, are consistent with the view that prices, the prices that are driving that higher inflation are from categories that are being directly affected by the recovery from the pandemic and the reopening of the economy. So, um, uh, the, for example, the experience with, uh, with lumber prices is, is illustrative of this. The thought is that um, prices like that that have moved up really quickly because of the uh, shortages and bottlenecks and the like, they should stop going up. And at some point, they, they in some cases, should actually go down. And we did see that in the case of lumber. Uh, another example where we haven't seen that yet is prices for used cars, which accounted for more than a third of the total increase in core inflation. Used car prices are going up because of sort of a perfect storm of very strong demand and limited supply. Uh, it's going up at a, just an amazing annual rate. Uh, but we do think that it makes sense that that would stop and that in fact it would reverse over time. So we think we'll be seeing some of that. When will we be seeing it? We're not sure. Um, that narrative seems, still seems quite likely to prove correct though, although, you know, as I pointed out at the last press conference, the, uh, the timing of that is, is pretty uncertain and so are the, the, the effects in the near term. But over time, it seems likely that these 
very specific things that are driving up uh, inflation uh, will be will be temporary. Um, and we'll be on, you know, we're going to be looking, we'll be looking at the monthly pricing data. I'll, I'll also say that the, the labor market uh, is going to be important both for the maximum employment uh, uh, goal, but also for inflation. And we'll be looking at that. And, I, and, and as, I, as I mentioned, we, we expect and I expect that we'll see increases in supply over coming months as the factors that we believe have been suppressing supply abate, wane, move, uh, move down. So I, I can't give you an exact number or exact time, uh, but I would say that uh, we do expect inflation to move down. If you look at the, the um, if you look at the uh, forecasts for 2021 and, and 2000, sorry, 2022 and 2023 among my colleagues on the, on the Federal Open Market Committee, you'll see that people do expect inflation to move down meaningfully toward our goal. And I think the full range of, uh, of, um, of uh, inflation projections for 2023 it falls between 2 and 2.3%, which is consistent with our, with our goals. Thank you. Now we'll go to Elon Moody at CNBC. My question for you is that you mentioned that your colleagues did have a discussion about uh, the progress that you're making toward uh, your uh, your goals uh, in order to consider tapering your asset purchases. In that discussion, you said that you didn't have made substantial progress yet, but that you expect to continue to make progress in that discussion. Did you guys talk about a timeline for when you expect to see that progress be made and when you might consider uh, starting to reduce those purchases? Right. So um, I expect that we'll be able to say more about timing as we see more data, basically. There's not a lot of more light I can, I can shed on that. But you can think of this meeting that we had as the talking about talking about meeting, if, if you like. And, and I now suggest that we retire that term, which has is, which is served its purpose well, I think. Um, so committee participants were of the view that uh, since the, we adopted that guidance in December, the economy has clearly made progress, although we are still a ways from our goal of substantial further progress. Participants expect continued progress uh, ahead toward that objective. And assuming that is the case, it will be appropriate to consider announcing a plan for reducing our asset purchases at a future meeting. So at coming meetings, the committee will continue to assess the economy's progress toward our goals and will give advance notice before announcing any decision. The timing, of course, the line will depend on the pace of that progress and not on any calendar. Thank you. Now we'll go to Chris Rudeger, AP. Hi, right, thank you. Um, well, you mentioned, uh, let me ask about inflation expectations. You said they were, uh, I think you mentioned in your opening statement that you saw them as within target. Um, does that mean that some of the shorter term measures we've seen out there, such as the New York Federal Reserve's three-year outlook, which uh, jumped a bit, should those sort of be dismissed? And are we only looked at, looking at longer term inflation expectations? And would you describe those as still well anchored at this point? And on a related note, uh, would the Fed consider publishing its index of common inflation expectations on a monthly basis? Thank you. Um, so we, we do tend to look at the longer term inflation expectations because that's really, um, uh, we think, what matters for, for inflation. Uh, so, and, and the, you know, the shorter term ones do tend to move around based on, for example, gasoline prices. So you'll see if gasoline prices were to spike, you'll see the shorter term inflation expectation me measures, particularly the surveys, move up. And, and that's, that's may, may, maybe not a good signal for future inflation if, if, if gas happens to, to spike and then go back down again. Um, so we, yes, I think if, if you look at the broad range of longer term inflation expectations, uh, they've moved up, they, they moved down during the, the beginning of the pandemic, you know, sort of further exacerbating concerns that we might find ourselves where, for example, the ECB and the Bank of Japan have been where you have expectations and inflation itself sliding down and you have a really hard time stopping that process once it begins. So that was a concern. Uh, so it's, it's good actually to see inflation, longer term inflation expectations move back up 
to a range. It's a range that's consistent with uh, what our objectives are. These are not precise measures, and that's and they, they contain uh, risk premiums of various kinds, and that's why we look at a broad range of them and tend to look at the movement of that broad range of uh, of, of indicators, which are which are from you know surveys of economists, surveys of the public, and also market based. It's a, it's a, it's it's a wide index, as, as I'm sure you know. We look at that and we see them back in the range where they were. Uh, and it, they, by the way, they've been broadly higher than that, somewhat modestly higher than that, not so many years ago at a time when inflation was was uh, was still anchored and at around two percent or maybe even a little bit below. So uh, the answer is yes, I think they are. Anchored and they're at a good place right now. It's gratifying to see them having moved up off of their pandemic lows. And you know, our, our, as you know, it's it's fundamental in our framework, our new framework, uh, to to assure that uh, inflation expect longer term inflation expectations are anchored at a place that is consistent with our goal. We we think that's uh, an important uh, reason. If if inflation expectations are not anchored at a place that's consistent with your goal. It's not clear why you would expect to hit your goal over the longer term. So it's important. Okay, now we'll go to James Politi with the FT. Sure, Paul. Hi, uh, thanks, Chair Paul. Um, your economic projections today forecast us uh, 7% growth in 2022, 4.5% core inflation of 3%. And if those conditions are achieved by the end of the year, would that constitute substantial further progress uh, in your mind? Um, and kind of more broadly, um, when we look at the sort of medium forecast for interest rates in 2023, showing not one but two interest rate increases um, at the time, I mean, is this kind of, can you describe the sort of tone of the, of the discussion in the committee? And are we really moving towards sort of a post pandemic stance with your greater confidence? Um, that you know the recovery will be, you know, a full recovery sooner than expected. The first question: the judgment of when we have uh, arrived at substantial further progress is one that the committee will make, and it would not be appropriate for me to lay out particular numbers that do or do not uh, that do or do not qualify. That is, that is, you know, the process that we're beginning now at the next meeting. We will begin meeting by meeting to. To assess that progress and talk about what we what we think we're seeing, and and just do all of the things that you do to sort of clarify your thinking around the process of deciding whether and how to adjust the pace and composition of asset purchases. Um, in terms of the, the the two hikes, so um, let me say a couple of things first of all, not for the first time about about the dot plot. These are, of course, individual projections. They're not a committee forecast. They're not a plan. Uh, and we did not actually have a discussion of whether liftoff is appropriate in any particular year, because discussing liftoff now would be would be highly premature. It wouldn't make any sense. In our, in our uh, if you look at the transcripts from five years ago, you'll see that sometimes people mention their rate path in their interventions. Often they don't. Um, and and the last thing to say is the dots are not a great forecaster of, of future rate moves. And that's not because it, it's just because it's so highly uncertain. There is no great forecaster of, of uh, future dots. So, so dots to be taken with it with a big, uh, big grain of salt. However, so let me talk about th this, uh, this, this meeting. Um, the committee spelled out, as you know, in our FOMC statements, the conditions that it expects to see before uh, an adjustment in the target range is made. And it's outcome based, it's not time based. And as I mentioned, it's labor market conditions consistent with maximum employment, inflation at 2%, and on track to exceed 2%. And the projections, they give some sense of how participants see the economy evolving in their most likely case. And I, honestly, the main message I would take away from the SEP is that participants, many, of, many participants, are more comfortable that the economic conditions in the committee's forward guidance will be met somewhat sooner than previously anticipated. And that would be a welcome development. If such outcomes materialize, it means the economy will have made faster progress toward our goals. So the other thing I'll say is rate increases are really not at all the focus of the committee. The, the focus of the committee is the current state of the economy. But in terms of our tools, it's about asset purchases. That's what we're thinking about. Liftoff is, is well into the future. The conditions for liftoff uh, 
we're very far from maximum employment, for example, uh, it's, it's a consideration for the future. So the, the near term thing is really the real near term discussion, discussion that will begin is really about the, the path of asset purchases. And as I mentioned, we, we had a discussion about that today and expect to, in future meetings, continue to see or think about our progress. Thank you. We'll go to Nancy Marshall Genzer from Marketplace. Uh, continuing, uh, Chair Powell, continuing in that vein, uh, when you're ready, how will you go about signaling the start of tapering when you do decide to do that? So, our intention for this process of, is that it will be orderly, uh, methodical, and transparent. And um, I can just tell you, we, we, uh, we see real value in communicating well in advance what our thinking is, and uh, we'll try to be clear. And as I mentioned, we'll, we'll give advance notice before announcing a decision to taper. And um, so I, I, all I can say is that, that we, we think it's important. We, we think where the balance sheet's concerned, a lot of notice, as much transparency as we can give and as far, as, as far in advance as we can to give people a chance to adjust their expectations. And, you know, we expect to be in that business until we reach substantial further progress and then have a, have a decision. Again, I have nothing further on time. It wouldn't be appropriate to say we're gonna have to see more data. We're a ways away from uh, substantial further progress, we think, uh, but we're making progress. So you can't, can't say generally how far in advance you would signal? Again, as we, as we approach that goal, <clears throat> we'll provide, um, you know, as much clarity as we can. Thank you. Going to Craig Torres at Bloomberg. Craig Torres at Bloomberg. If I were a businessman looking at the forecast today, I would ask how and when the Fed seeks to achieve an average of 2% inflation. In other words, does the FOMC have a look back period? Or does it plan to suppress inflation in outer years? Because over the next three years, you're gonna be above inflation. So what is your look back period? Does the committee have one? And if not, why not? And if they don't, why isn't this just flexible inflation target targeting without an average in a range of two to two and a quarter percent? Thanks. You know, we, so as part of our year and a half long uh, process, uh, the review that we did, uh, and came out with at the end of uh, that with the um, with the new statement on longer run goals and, and monetary policy strategy. We look carefully at the idea. We've all read all the literature around <clears throat> different formulas for makeup and things like that, and we concluded. And uh, you know, I strongly agree that uh, it's not wise to to wed yourself to a particular formulation of that. So we did adopt a discretionary. <clears throat> Uh, it's a, there's an element of discretion in it. Uh, you know, it says that we will seek to seek inflation that runs moderately above 2% for some time. And it's, it's meant to create a broad sense that we want inflation to average 2% over time. Uh, but, and that under the old, under the old formula, under the old framework, uh, what was happening was 2% was a ceiling because all of the errors were below, you were always getting back to 2%. So you were bouncing back and forth between one and a half and two, and we wanted them to be centered around two. So, so that's, that's the approach that we're taking. Uh, and, and you're right, it's not, it's not a formula-like approach. We were clear on that when we announced the framework. Was there another part of your question, Craig? Craig? Uh, that pretty much answers it, Chair Powell. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll go to Michael Derby. Uh, just for taking my question. Um, so I wanted to ask you about the uh, reverse repo uh, usage that we've seen lately. I was curious if you are at all concerned about the uh, level of money flowing into the reverse repo facility, and do you believe that the changes in the Fed's uh, rate control toolkit today will have any impact on that? And then in a related question, um, do you think that Fed asset purchases are taking too many safe assets out of the market right now? maybe some dislocations in uh, the money markets. So on the, um, on the facility, uh, we think it's doing its job. We think it's doing the, the reverse repo facility is, is doing what it's supposed to do, which
which is to provide a floor under under money market rates and keep the federal funds rate well within its uh, well within its range. So we're not concerned with it. It's doing. You, you have an unusual situation where uh, the Treasury General account is is shrinking and bill supply is shrinking, and so there's there's downward pressure. We're buying assets. There's downward pressure on short term rates, and it, the, that facility is is doing what we think it's supposed to do. Sorry, your second question was again. Yeah, I mean, the change, change in the rate control toolkit, would that have any impact on, do you think that will reduce the, uh, the amount of money coming into reverse repos? Would that have any impact on money market conditions that, uh, you know, beyond the Fed funds rate setting? It could have some impact. I think we'll have to see empirically, but it's designed to keep the federal funds rate in, in, in uh, you know, within the range. And um, uh, I do think it could have some effect on, on broader money market conditions below as it relates to you know the very low rates and the downward pressures. Okay. And, and will it, will it, do you think it will lower uptake from the reverse repo facility, or, or that's just not even really a focus of what the change was? It's not honestly, and, and you know the, the funny thing you would think that it would, but we'll have to see. It's it's uh, that it, it, there it's possible that, that that would not be the case. Well, that's going to be an empirical question. Okay. okay cool. Thank you. Go to Gina Smialik, the New York Times. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you for taking our questions. I was wondering if you could follow up a little bit on response to Rachel at the very beginning and talk a little bit about how we should understand what full employment means in a world that, as you mentioned, is pretty royal. All the data is pretty, pretty royal by the pandemic, and we're not really sure where it is going to settle in, we're not sure where participation is going to settle in, and wages are already looking you know, decent. So I guess I wonder what full employment means in this context and, and how you're thinking about those wage data. Yeah, um, as you well know, um, there isn't one indicator we can look to, and there's no one number that we can therefore point to. Uh, we look at a range of indicators, and it's a very broad range. You can count to a high number just quickly, but, uh, but certainly it, it will include things like unemployment and participation and wages and many different flavors of that. Um, so how do we think about it? Um, a couple things. I, we're all going to be informed by what we saw in the last cycle, which was labor supply outperforming expectations over a long period of time. Now, that, was, that hadn't happened in many other cycles, but this was a very long cycle. So we're going to have to be alert to see whether that can happen again. It is a different, it's a different economy. We, we have had uh, a slew of retirements, and that may weigh on participation. That, that effect, though, should wear off in a few years, and and uh, you know as as uh, you move through that window, because they would have, people would have retired anyway, and you'll be back where you, you would have been. So I think we're I, I think the lesson number one is is just to um, be careful about assessing maximum employment, and uh, uh, I think if you during the last cycle there were there were waves of concern that we were reaching full employment as early. You know, as as 2012, when I arrived at the Fed, and you know, you know, nine years later, eight years later, we were still creating jobs, and and uh, you know, it, it was quite remarkable. So we're all going to be informed by that. At the same time, we understand this is a different economy. Um, you know, the the demographics are people are getting older, and, and that should have a secular uh, uh, effect to of of uh, reducing participation over time. So we have to be sensible about what the, what can be done, but I think we're going to be we're going to lean into that and be optimistic. You asked about wages. You know, we we're seeing wage increases. That's that's sort of a natural uh, thing to be seeing in a strong economy. And uh, what we're seeing is that we don't see anything that's troubling in the sense of what would be troubling would be you know very uh, wide wide across the economy wages at unsustainable levels. Uh, without high inflation, in other words, wages in excess of productivity and inflation, but in by a meaningful amount broadly across the economy, sort of forcing companies to keep raising prices and getting into a wage, that wage price cycle. That that that's the old formula for one of the old formulas for having high inflation. We don't see anything like that now. We do see high wages. We see them for for people who are mostly new, you know, entering into new jobs. Many of them in low skilled jobs and. Um, we do think so. you've got a you've got a thing in the labor market right now where where supply and demand are just not matched up well, 
And you know, we think it's a flexible economy, and, and it will clear. There will there will be a, a level at which uh, supply and demand meet, and that'll that we think that'll that'll be happening in coming months. So, but I, the last thing I'll say is again, um, if you look at at the forecasts, we're going to be at a, in a very strong labor market uh, pretty quickly here. We, we, there are still a big group of unemployed people, and you know, we're not going to forget about them. We're we're going to we're going to do everything we can to get people back into work and give them the chance to, to work. Um, but there's every reason to think that we'll be in, in, a, in a labor market with uh, very attractive numbers, with low unemployment, high participation, and rising wages across the spectrum. So that's, that's a little bit how we're looking at the, at the labor market. Thank you. Now we'll go to Hannah Lane at the American Banker. Hi, uh, I wanted to ask about the status of your thinking around the supplementary leverage ratio right now. Uh, is the Fed still thinking about ways to permanently adjust this to account for the high growth in deposits? And do you ultimately believe a permanent fix is needed? And um, any information on the timing around that would be, would be helpful. I can say is we're working on it. Um, um, don't have anything to, to share with you in terms of the particulars or the timing right now, unfortunately, but um, we, we've always our position has been for a long time and, and is now that we, we like the leverage ratio to be a backstop to risk-based capital requirements. When leverage requirements are, are, are binding, it does skew incentives for firms to substitute low-risk assets for, for high-risk ones. It's a straightforward thing. And because of the substantial increase in reserves, treasuries, and other safe assets in the banking system, the SLR is rapidly ceasing to be, um, to, ceasing to be the intended backstop. Uh, that, that we, for our big firms that we want it to be. So we do think it's appropriate to consider uh, uh, ways to adapt it to this new high reserves environment, and, and we're looking hard at the issue. Um, we would also, just to be really clear, we will take whatever actions are necessary to assure that any changes we do make, recommend, do not erode the overall strength of bank capital requirements. So oh, sorry. So I can't give you any more. It's just something we're working on. Thank you. Now we'll go to Annika Tappa at CNN Business. Hi there. Thanks for taking my question. Chairman Powell, the price jumps we've seen in some raw materials, lumber, for example, you mentioned it earlier, seem to be easing, and it looks like we're at the beginning of suppliers catching up with demand. But I wonder if you're worried at all if we're going to end up with excess supply immediately after those shortages were off, and if we just continue this mismatch. Um, as we're recovering and you know we're getting out of the pandemic economy, and I wonder um, how that would affect the Fed's office at all. Well, that is really not the problem we're having right now. But but and it, actually, people who work in uh, commodity industries are very focused on that because they know that you know they don't want to build uh, build capacity and then find out that it's not necessary. Um, so really, the problem now is is that. Uh, demand is very, very strong. Incomes are high. People have money on their uh, in, in the bank accounts. Uh, demand for goods is extremely high, and it hasn't uh, hasn't come down. We're seeing the service sector reopening, and so you're seeing prices are moving back up off their lows there. Um, but in terms of of overcorrecting, I mean, I, I think there there is a possibility on the other side of this that that uh, inflation could be could actually be quite low. Going forward, but that's not that's not really where our focus is right now. We're, our focus right now is um, we need to our our expectation is that these uh, these high inflation readings that we're seeing now will start to abate, and that's that's what we think, and it'll be like the lumber experience and like we expect the used car experience to be with things like airplane tickets and and. Uh, uh, hotels, which are the other two factors in, in the most recent CPI report that, that went up a lot. We expect that those prices will get back up to where they were, but there's no reason to think that they're going to keep going up a lot. Uh, because if they are, people will build no, new hotels. There's no reason for supply and demand to be out of whack in the hotel business over any period of time. So we think that'll happen. Um, I think in terms of the timing uh, and the effects on inflation in the near term, there's a lot of uncertainty. The overall story is one that, that we think is right, and we think the income and data uh, support it. And uh, uh, you know, so do many, many forecasters. And uh, and if you look at the forecasts on, on the uh, FOMC, you will, you will see that as well. But 
we don't we don't in any way um, dismiss the chance that it can work out that that this goes on longer than expected and the risk would be that over time it does begin to affect inflation expectations and if we see inflation expectations and inflation or or inflation moving up in a way that is really uh, materially above what we what we would see as consistent with our goals uh, and persistently so we wouldn't hesitate to use our tools to address that that's it, it, price stability is half of our mandate and, and and we would certainly do that we do not expect that that, that is not our base case and, and and in that we're joined by many other forecasters but there's a lot to be humble about among forecasters forecasters have a lot to be humble about it's a, it's a highly uncertain business and we're um, we're very much attuned to the risks and and watching the data carefully in the meantime i would say you know we should as i mentioned earlier there's so much uncertainty around this uh, it's it's just a unique situation that we need to see how things evolve in coming months and and uh, see how that story holds up and act accordingly Thank you. We'll go to Howard Schneider at Reuters. Uh, Howard Schneider, Reuters. Thanks, Chair Powell, for taking this. I don't want to miss a moment here, and I just I noticed that in the statement you uh, dropped the language saying that the pandemic is weighing on the economy. So, uh, is this the effective uh, end, in your view, of the pandemic as a constraint on economic activity, even though it's still cited as a risk? You know, it's a it's a it's a continuum, right? You you what you've seen with the pandemic is uh, sharply declining cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, and that's great. Uh, and and you know that should continue. But you know, you you also saw in the United Kingdom, which has I think at least as high, if not higher, vaccination rates, they've had uh, an outbreak of the Delta variety, and it's and it's causing them to to have to, to have to react to that. So. You're not you're not out of the woods at this point, and it would be premature to, I, to in my thinking, it would be premature to declare victory. Vaccination is still has a ways to go to get to levels. It, it would be good to see it get to a substantially higher level, um, and you know that can only help. Uh, so I, look, I, but I, you're right. The statement language is evolving. I would expect it to continue to evolve. There's a lot of judgment in that, I, but you can expect us to drag our feet a little bit on that because. Uh, that's what you do with statement language. Uh, it, it's great to see the progress, but I, again, I would not declare victory yet. I would say it, it is so great to see the reopening of the economy, though, and to see people out living their lives again. Uh, you know, who, who doesn't want to see that? And it, it appears to be safe, and I just would encourage people to continue to get vaccinated. If I could follow up on that, if you, if you view the statement in, in Toto and the, and the dots and the steps as well, um, it, do you think this is more of a market, market exercise around the improvement in health or around the inflation risks you see developing out there? I think it's both. No, I, I think clearly um, since March, uh, what's happened is people have grown more confident in these very strong outcomes that they'll be achieved, that very strong outcomes in the economy will be achieved. There's, there's more grounds for comfort. We've seen growth coming in higher than we expected. We've seen very strong labor demand. We've also seen, uh, we have seen inflation ab above target though. And I think even though, you know, in, in the, our forecasters case, they do see inflation coming back down over 22 and 23 into, into areas that are very consistent with our, with our mandate. Nonetheless, the risk is, is something that can factor into people's thinking about appropriate monetary policy. The thing is, you know, th these are 18 different forecasts, and um, it's it, I can't stand here and say exactly what was in all 18 people's minds, but that that is something that I think can factor into things as well, factor into for uh, our forecasts as well. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Victoria Guida with Politico. Hi, Chair Powell. Um, I, I want to ask a little bit more about inflation to make sure I understand how you're thinking about this. So. In the projections, um, inflation is expected to, to be high this year and then come back down next year and then maybe start to rise a little bit again, um, enough for a lift off in 2023. You know, I have us obviously, to, you know, take the grain of salt, but that would suggest that you all could theoretically see inflation sustainably staying above 2%. Um, and so 
I guess my question is, what would be causing that inflation? What what is what would be um, because it seems like you all now see a situation in which inflation would be rising in a way that isn't caused by mandatory factors in the in the next couple of years. So would that be the result of the tight labor market? Would that be because this whole situation has raised people's inflation expectations? How are you thinking about that? So what we're seeing in the near term, again, our base case is that what we're seeing in the near term is is principally associated with uh, with the reopening of the economy and not with a tight labor market or tight resource constraints, really. Uh, so you're right. When you, when you get to in, in the forecast, all of that, the you know, supply and demand sides of the economy adapt. We have a very highly adapted, you know, flexible economy, more so than most. And uh, by 2023, th those increases are really about uh, about you know rising resource utilization, or to put it a different way, you know, low unemployment, or high employment is a way to think about it. So that's what that's about. That's that's about. Um, the, the kind of broad inflationary pressure that results from, uh, you know, a really strong expansion, tightening up resource utilization across the whole economy, and lifting, lifting up inflation. That, that's why, and that's why you would see it then, because by then, you know, in the forecast, and it's just a forecast, it's, they're just individual forecasts in people's forecasts. Um, that's what's happening. So it's it's so that the, the change in the projections reflect the fact that. You all are more optimistic about the economic outlook, and not necessarily that you think that this will change the way people think about inflation. Yeah, I, I think it, there may be an element of the latter as well, because inflation expectations have continued to move up. It's in, you know, it's all in people's individual thinking, and, and it, it, you can't. It's it's hard to say. It's not something the committee debates uh, in terms of you know what what the outlook is for two thousand twenty three. So I'm. I'm a little bit speculating, which I shouldn't do, but I, I wouldn't surprise me if there's an element for some people in, you know, seeing the inflation performance that we've had and thinking that I have more confidence that we could see inflation above 2%, uh, that it may not be as hard to do that as we thought, and that inflation expectations may move up to a, to a level, they, they were really at a level that was kind of a little below uh, 2%. They might move up as a consequence of this, or or, or as a consequence of of, uh, of the new framework. You know, we did see inflation expectations moving up uh, in the, in the wake of the announcement of the framework, but you know, we don't really know that. So ultimately, um, I think it's consistent with both those things. Thank you. Now we'll go to Greg Robb at Market Watch. Hi. I thank you for taking my question. Chair, I'm just looking at the forecast, and one thing I just don't think it's been talked about all that much is how much you got the Fed thinks that the economy is going to slow next year. I mean, are we looking at a scenario of a slowing economy next year as with higher inflation? And and what do you think about that? We're looking at an economy that will not have the degree of uh, fiscal support. The fiscal support in the forecasts. Uh, is much less than it was this year. So, but you you still got a very strong uh, growth, well above the longer run potential uh, output of the of the economy. You've got you've got growth meaningfully above that, and inflation is lower next year in all of our in all of our forecasts. Uh, I think the range of of core PCE forecasts for next year is one point seven to two point five in two thousand twenty two, and and two to two point three in two thousand and twenty three. So. You're, you're right. You're seeing. I, I, I can't remember the number, but it, it might be in the threes, three, three and a half percent growth for next year. That's a that's a really good year. Coming on the back of a seven percent growth year, that's a really good year. That's a, that's a year with a lot of momentum. That'll see you know that'll cause significant job creation, um, and, and it will. I mean, we we would take three and a half percent. We didn't have a three and a half percent. Growth year. We didn't have a three percent growth year between the global financial crisis and the end of the expansion. So that would be a good year. Doesn't it seem like there's a risk of of you know like stagflation where that, that if you're going to go from seven percent and down, that means the economy is really just you know dropping and in some way we haven't seen that right. That's well, it, this economy is not not decelerating. The economy is still growing. And growing at a, a very healthy rate. Our estimate, I mean, different people have different estimates, but broadly speaking, economists think the economy has the potential to grow at around 2% per year. If you're growing above that, 
then the unemployment rate should be declining. People should be being pulled into the labor force. Wages should be going up. Lots of things should be happening. The businesses should be investing. So, uh, you know, the, I, I guess to answer your question in a different way, is there a risk that inflation will be higher than we think? Yes, as I said earlier, you know, we, we don't have any certainty about the timing uh, or the extent of these effects from reopening. And, we, and therefore, we don't, we don't think that, it, we think it's unlikely that they would uh, materially affect the underlying inflation dynamics that the economy's had for a quarter of a century. The, the underlying forces around the globe that have created those dynamics are intact, and those are aging population, low productivity, globalization, all of those things that, that we think um, have, have you know, really held down inflation. But all that's out there still. You know, when we get through this, we may well we'll be facing those same forces. Nonetheless, uh, is there a risk that inflation will remain higher than we than we thought? Yes, and if if we see inflation moving above our goals in, in a time, it, it, sorry, to an extent, to a level, or or a persistent or persistently enough, uh, you know, we would be prepared to use our tools to address that. Thank you. Going to Brian Chung with Yahoo. Oh. Uh, Brian Chung, Yahoo Finance. Uh, on that point, you talked about maybe some more structural changes in that last answer with regards to productivity. I noted that the uh, even projection for R star, the longer term interest rate, is still the same at 2.5%. But there's been some literature out there that maybe the COVID crisis could have actually change some of the underlying fundamentals of the economy and maybe change productivity in addition to combined with demographic changes that have already been in effect to suggest that that longer term neutral rate or R star might be higher. What would the implications of that be for monetary policy? Do you think that maybe the Fed could have the possibility of underestimating the long run neutral rate and what might be the impact of that? Uh, a higher neutral rate would mean that interest rates would run higher by that amount. Uh, that, 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 and, and that would be a good thing from the standpoint of the economy because it would give the Fed more room to cut rates. The problem with, with interest rates being close to the lower bound, of course, is that it really cuts into our ability to react to a downturn, for example, a pandemic. And you, you, if you look, for example, at the European Central Bank, their, their policy rate was well below zero when, when the pandemic hit. So we don't want to be in a place where we can't react. A higher neutral rate would, would be, from that narrow standpoint, would be a good thing for us. It would give us more room, and therefore, then that would tend to result in better outcomes for the economy over time. You know, we it's you can't estimate it with great with great precision. I think we would be alert to. Um, I mean, studying our star is a is a whole industry unto itself, and I, I think we would be alert to factors that might raise uh, uh, our star, the, the, the neutral rate of interest. And you know, we we try to keep up with that, and I, I think we're, we're we're all thinking about that and the possibility of that. Um, you know, there, there are many, there, there are a lot of stories right now that could, that essentially could lead to higher productivity growth and higher R star. We don't know which of those stories will come true, but I mean, I'll give you an example. It's just, there are a lot of, there are a lot of startups, a lot of early stage companies. And is that going to have that effect? We don't know, but we'll be watching those things carefully. Great. Thank you for the last question. We'll go to Michael McKee at Bloomberg TV. Uh, Mr. Chairman, of course, you'll be shocked to learn that uh, you have some critics on Wall Street. And I would like to paraphrase a couple of their criticisms and get your reaction to them. One is that the new policy framework is that you react to actual data and do not react to forecasts, yet the actual inflation data is coming in hot and you're relying on the forecast that it will cool down in order to make policy. I want to get uh, your view on how you square that. Another is that you have a long runway, uh, you've said, for tapering uh, with announcements. But if the data keep coming in faster than expected, are you trapped by a fear of a taper tantrum from uh, advancing the uh, time period in which you announce at a taper? And finally, uh, you've said the Fed knows how to combat inflation, but raising rates also slows the economy. And there's a concern that you might be sacrificing the economy if you wait too long and have to raise rates too quickly. So that's a, that's a few questions there. Um, <laughs> but so let me say first, 
Um, I think people mis misinterpret the framework. I think that the frame, there's nothing wrong with the framework, and there's nothing in the framework that would in any way in, you know, interfere with our ability to pursue our, our goals. That's for starters. Uh, all of our discussions and all of our thinking and planning are taking place in the context of our new framework. We're certainly committed to it. We think it's well suited to our goals, include, including in, in this unique time. Uh, and I think if you look at the look at the uh, the forecasts uh, that we we writ, written down, uh, you know our committee is solidly behind them. The forecasts are all consistent with that. Um, you know, your specific question, I guess, was uh, will we be behind the curve? And um, you know that's that's not the situation we're facing at all. The, the situation that we we addressed in our in our statement of longer run goals and monetary policy strategy was a situation in which uh, employment was at very high levels, but inflation was low. And what we said was we wouldn't raise interest rates just because unemployment was low, employment was high, if there was no evidence of inflation or other troubling imbalances. So that's what we said. That is not at all the current situation. The current situation, we have many millions of people who are unemployed, and we have inflation running well above our target. The question we face with this inflation has nothing to do with our framework. It's a, it's a, a, a very different, a very difficult version of a standard investment, sorry, a, a central banking question. And that is, how do you separate in inflation? How do you separate things that, that's, that follow from broad upward price pressures from things that, are, that really are a function of, of uh, sort of idiosyncratic factors in a particular due to a particular things. I mean, a classic example was, to pick a narrow example, was the cell phone price war back in 2017, if you remember it. There was a, prices were incredibly low and it held down core PCE by three-tenths or something for a year and then it fell out. So this is much bigger than that. And of course, it's not, it's not easy to tell in real time which is which, but that's, that's the question that you would face under really any framework. And, you know, we're trying to sort that out. I've tried to, to explain that today about, about how we think about that. Um, and you, you know, we, we do think that these are uh, temporary factors and that they'll wane. We can't be absolutely certain about the timing of that, and we're prepared to use our tools as appropriate. Your second one was, um, uh, uh, you know, we we will um, we will taper when we feel that the economy has achieved substantial further progress, and we will communicate very carefully in advance on that. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're going to do. And, and we will follow through on that. There's no, uh, I mean, we, we will do what we can to avoid a market reaction. But ultimately, when we achieve our macroeconomic goal, we will, we will, we will taper as appropriate. The third thing was, what was the third thing? If, if you raise rates to control inflation, you also slow the economy. And the history of the Fed is that sometimes you go too far. Right. And, um, we look. I mean, we have to balance the two the two goals: maximum employment and price stability. Often they are they do pull in the same direction, of course. Uh, but um, when we when we raise interest rates to control inflation, there's no question that it has an effect on activity, and that's the channel one of the channels through which we get a, get to inflation. We we don't think that we're in a situation like that right now. We think that the economy is recovering from a deep hole. Uh, an unusual uh, hole, actually, because it's to do with uh, with shutting down the economy. It turns out it's a heck of a lot easier to create demand than it is to you know to bring supply back up to snuff. That's happening all over the world. There's no reason to think that that process will last indefinitely. Uh, but we're gonna you know we're gonna watch carefully to make sure that that evolving inflation and, and our, our understanding of what's happening is 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 right. And in the meantime, we'll conduct policy appropriately. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Yeah. Um, this is uh this is a bizarre world, right? But I think they just yeah. sold off so much into it. And 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 uh, there you go, seven days in a row. Uh, I was down on a closing basis. What did I didn't have any particular level here? I was hoping for 152.14. We only got to 153.11. So, yeah, little turnaround here. Uh, still green. The session up. A
All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, well, I guess uh, there is no need to trade for the day. Definitely, we didn't take anything because um, there was nothing new from uh, Jerome Powell. It was the same as uh, what they said in the statement. So, therefore, I would still suggest no trades for the night. Of course, the market is closed already. But, I mean, we trimmed some of the losses in uh, the U.S. equities. Uh, but still, I am not even doubting uh, our decision not being able to uh, to trade. That is, uh, that was actually the right decision to be done. Um, hopefully, maybe by tomorrow, we'll see. Uh, if you um, read our written reports, we will, of course, send out an update. But I'm happy we didn't trade actually this uh, environment today. Um, because that is how it is supposed to be. You don't chase the move, and you just wait for the right for the right time. So that will be it uh, uh, for today. There was nothing actually to be added more than uh, what uh, Jim Powell actually said today. Uh, so that's why I just decided just to watch. Nothing much really. Uh, thank you all for coming today, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again next week with another stream, or maybe we'll do maybe another stream in the next few days, or. I guess maybe at the beginning of next week uh, in English again, so we can also trade in a better environment. At least we didn't lose anything. We didn't enter any trades. So no loss is still a profit to me. Thank you all for coming again, and we'll see you again uh, next week. Have a good day.